Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sustainable Solutions with Planet Aid, a podcast featuring in depth conversations with innovators creating solutions to tackle the most pressing issues facing our planet and communities. Join us every month as we embark on a journey of discovery, hope, and change. And please don't forget to like the episode, share, and most of all, hit that subscribe button. And now your host, Planet Aid's communication and content specialist, Monica Johnson. Thank you, Haley, and welcome to Sustainable Solutions with Planet Aid. I'm Monica Johnson, and I'm going to be your guide on this journey as we take challenging situations and try to simplify them. Now, in this podcast, we'll explore some of the critical challenges our world faces, from the environment to education barriers to agriculture, health, and wellness. And we also learn from incredible individuals like our guests today and organizations at the forefront of developing and implementing sustainable solutions to these very issues. Change is not only possible, but essential, and it begins with understanding. So today we're going to be talking to Erin Dorr, a sustainability professional for the town of Bedford, Massachusetts. And we're going to be talking about how Bedford is making a real impact in waste reduction. Welcome, Erin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Erin, can you just give us a little bit of a, a rundown of who you are and where you, um, where you work? As well. Sure. Um, I'm Erin. I work with the town of Bedford in uh, primarily our schools and municipal buildings on uh, school-wide programs to reduce consumption, our waste reduction, uh, really reducing our climate impact and our climate footprint. How did you, how did your career lead to this work? It's a roundabout path. This is actually my career 2.0. Um, I was in the financial industry for about uh, 20 years and left downtown Boston, took a small uh, career sabbatical. And in that time, I got to get involved in organizations and causes that were meaningful to me that I didn't have time to do when I was working in downtown. And uh, that led me to uh, this path of uh, composting and, and recycling and uh I live in the town of Bedford, and I got to meet some of the great people here and really just started working with facilities in that capacity. So tell me a little bit about what inspired Bedford, uh, Massachusetts, to seek counsel or instruction to improve their sustainability efforts. What was, <laughs> what was the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so we have, um, in general, I would I would say that Bedford is a real um, eco-conscious and eco-friendly environment um, community. We have a lot of trails and um, a lot of uh, like like bike organizations and mothers out front and, and climate impact organizations here. Um, but our town underwent a uh, climate impact study. We have a energy net zero plan that was put into place. And that's really what's um, guiding the movement of Bedford um, towards, you know, a much more sustainable 2050 goal like the state has. So it's coming up on a year in November since uh, Massachusetts uh, textile dumping ban went into place. How did the ban force behavioral change in the state and the cities and municipalities? So I think the ban was great in, in a few different aspects um, and could use a little bit of help in a couple of others. So it was great in that it gave us a top-down approach for um, implementing some of these plans that may or may not have gotten off the ground from a grassroots side, just you know, one little person beating the drum here in, in the Bedford schools, um, it was really easy to say, hey, look, the state has put in this really important ban and uh, there are some great options that we can do here in Bedford to uh, lean into that you know, responsibility. Um, I do think that, um, that PR and marketing and um, support of what to do with the textiles instead of the trash is um, is a missing link. So mm -hmm. I was aware of uh, the textile bins because we see them around town in other locations and had gotten our schools involved in adopting these. Um, it's really a win-win because our children get to learn about the importance of, of 
not trash and recycling and upcycling, but also they can, the schools can earn money and everyone knows school budgets are really tight. So the rebates are, uh, are a fun kickback. So you have an ongoing project supporting, like you were ta- just talking about, a school waste reduction. Why do you think targeting schools um, as a place to eliminate waste and specifically, you know, textile waste, um, why is that so necessary? And, and what are you seeing from this program? So our students, um, they are the generation that's inheriting these climate issues. They aren't the generation that created them. Um, we, though that being said, they are the change agents that are going to take us over that, that threshold of, um, you know, that, that sort of point of no return. Our goal at 2050, this is the generation that is going to be, you know, making those changes and adapting and uh, working in the space to mitigate and adapt to climate change and try and reduce it at that point. So, um, so they're like our, our little ball of clay. They are, they are our future and, um, and they're so adaptable and so resilient. And uh, so that's why I think it's really important. It also is important because a lot of these students are doing some of this work at home. They're recycling at home. They're composting at home. Um, they may know that they shouldn't be tossing textiles in the trash at home. So when they come into school, if they're getting a different message than that, it can be confusing. It can be inconsistent. Um, subsequently, when they learn those good habits at, at school and they're teaching their peers, they could go home and teach their families too. So it kind of creates a little spider web of, of education and knowledge. And it's very interesting because that is kind of what has happened uh, with this generation anyway. They've just been learning about recycling since they've entered into schools. And I've I can say for myself, that was not in any of my classes when I was growing up. So they have more of a, just something that's like rooted in them to say, okay, this is trash, but this is, you know, what can it be recycled? They're they're really aware. Yeah, they're really aware. They really care. Uh, When we started doing composting in, in one of our cafeterias, kids were saying, oh, this is great. We, I've been wanting to do this. And that was part of that, you know, kids were asking for it and the parents were asking for it. We just didn't have the momentum and, and top-down Structure, policy right. yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that we saw in an article that Bedford Citizen was the fact that plenty bins are in at least two of the four schools that are in uh, Bedford, Massachusetts. Tell me what was the reasoning behind wanting to put bins at the schools? Uh, our schools are in, most of our schools are in a central uh, campus location in the center of our town. So one, we wanted to, we, we chose our schools based on, um, and, and the bins based on having one in every sort of angle of the town, every corner of the town to make it as easy as possible for people to bring their, um, their textiles as they are going to a sports game or driving to the library or, you know, just going through town that they can toss those there. Um, we also, the rebate, the rebate is uh, a real nice kickback that helps as essentially a fundraiser for the schools. Um, people are really interested in, uh, in contributing to our school programs. And some of our schools have those funds earmarked for, green initiatives or the environmental club or the garden club. And so it's really continuing that cycle of, um, of climate impact. Very good. So one of the things that I heard you say was about the accessibility. That's the first part of that. How important is it for people to be able to have that accessibility in order to, you know, have the inspiration or encouragement to recycle? Accessibility is is key. Uh, we're really lucky in Bedford. We have uh, street curb curbside pickup for our trash, and even um, companies do compost curbside pickup. We can um, recycle other things at, at our curb as well. But the important piece is that it's close by. It's got to be easy, and textiles can get pretty heavy pretty quickly. So if you know, people are putting things into a bag. We want to be able to make sure we can get that bag into a place where they can lift it up and 
get it into the bin, that the bins are being emptied on a regular basis. And we've had really great luck with, um, with that whole service process. And I'm just curious, in the town of Bedford, and I'm guessing in Massachusetts, what was one of the things that uh, people had to learn as a, le- as a learning curve with recycling their textiles? Because I imagine if you say recycle, people put things in the recycling bin that's in front of their home. So was that an issue? Yeah, we, you know, we get a lot of questions and I love questions because that means people are, are hearing the message and curious, um, but it, marketing and publicity is super key. Um, there was a real disconnect at first, people thinking more like a goodwill, something had to be in, in perfect do- donatable condition. And so that was one of the, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a hurdle, but one of the things that we um, had to address is Everything that's from broken socks to stuffies, um, you know, we all, it's a young community. We have kids. We have a lot of stuffed animals in our house, um, blankets, uh, rags, things that you wouldn't think of having another useful life really do. And so that education piece has been really important to help um, explain we can take the good stuff. We absolutely want that. But we can also take things that may not have a life anywhere and create a new life for it. And it's wonderful that you also spoke about the reward of uh, donating and the fact that you can support uh, schools as well. So that's a that's a wonderful thing. Um, so on the reverse side of it, there's, there's also some things that can be, I, I'm guessing there, there are penalties as well if you don't do this correctly, correct? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I would assume statewide as the bans uh, sort of ratchet up a little bit. You've got, you know, a textile ban. We're getting into a food waste ban. We've got had a mattress recycling ban. Um, as those become more stringent, as they, they should, and help uh, engage our uh, activity and, and how we are thinking about um, consumables, it's going to be really important to um, make sure you know, if if we're not following along, what is the impact there? Um, what are the implications? Is it just this overarching, you know, our climate could be in peril, our weather will change more frequently? Is there an actual monetary fine? What is the, how's the ratcheting up of the state policy going to truly affect me as an individual? Um, and right now they're, they're really, isn't some it's a you know this is a ban we shouldn't be doing this um it should be going here but outside of that it's really up to me as the consumer if i'm following the the guidelines Got it. okay okay um so one of the things that i would say is something that you would want as investment from your from the people that you're you're dealing with as far as the, the, the textile recycling. How do you, how have you gauged that? How is that investment uh, in, in the purpose of this? So the investment is really low on, on Bedford's side. Um, I think more it's an an investment or an engagement investment. Um, What we do at the beginning of every school year is put that information into the parents' newsletters. So uh, caregivers are seeing that you know, there is a waistband. Why are we doing it? This is what can be included in that. And here's where you can drop items off. Uh, we also do different challenges in schools uh, to come up with a certain tonnage or, or weight. Uh, we've done different uh, drives and we posted on our Facebook family groups so that it's content running articles like in the Bedford Citizen, just so that we can keep the the concept in the forefront. I think I used to hear that it took someone about seven times hearing something to actually register that kind of information. And I ran into someone today who wasn't aware of the waistband. So it's happening on a daily basis and having champions like myself and our little students, uh, it's, you know, that information gets disseminated a little bit faster. 
And I love the fact that with the combined effort of the, the four schools um, and the then the four bins, I'm, I'm guessing it's four bins, mm-hmm. um, that you've collected over 60 tons of textiles since being placed in 2020. So speaking to uh, Planet Aid, what made it mo- motivated the decision to incorporate Planet Aid bins in the waste reduction plan for schools? And it, it had to be a, a plan. Uh, that you came up with as far as that goes. Yeah, we, you know, it really was, um, we're taking a look district-wide at a uh, sustainability policy for our our school district and uh, on the municipal side as well. It is important for us to be leading by example, being those, uh, you know, good leaders and, and stewards of our environment for our children and that they're seeing this. Also, that we are um, falling in line with some of the guidance that the state is giving. That we are being, you know, that that we are being considerate and uh, consistent with what the state is asking us to do. We're following those rules. Um, it's an important thing for for children to learn in general, uh, but also knowing. You know, we took a look at our locations and had to identify what's going to be the most um, public and visible location in those schools. And the Planet Aid bins are bright yellow, so that really captures the attention. Um, and we have great signs that say, you know, uh, textile and clothing recycling here. Uh, so location was a big piece. Uh, visibility and as we looked at additional ways we could show sustainability, uh, we get a lot lot of lost and found in each of our schools every year. So the kids at the end of the year now are seeing us after we've divvied everything out and anything with names goes back to where it belongs, they're seeing us take that to the recycling bins. And it's just kind of leading by example. So again, we've talked about 60 tons since 2020. What's your reaction when you hear those numbers? Does it provide any kind of additional motivation for your waste reduction efforts? I, I imagine it makes you feel pretty proud. The The 60,000 pounds is really remarkable. Um, it's sort of a, how do we even quantify what that looks like? And to me, I think back to in in class when I was in elementary school, they said 2,000 tons is equal to an elephant, roughly. So I took a picture of 30 elephants stacked on top of each other and showed that to my son. And I said, look, this is how much, if these elephants were all the the clothing, like this is how much clothing our town has, has, you know, saved from, from incineration or in in a dump situation so it is pretty remarkable and watching the trajectory every year even though we have expanded to additional schools it hasn't just taken that same amount and spread it out linear we're still growing we have a trajectory every single year that year over year is up 35 percent so it goes to okay is part of that that there's more people buying clothing or is it just there's more that they're realizing can be recycled, um, hoping it's more of the latter. <laughs> so I also want to say that in that same article, September 23, Bedford Citizen article, um, it has a quote saying, textile recycling is centered around being thoughtful about your own needs and the planet. So just from a personal standpoint, please, if you can elaborate on how it correlates to the buy where, where once and trash. And I'll say that again, the buy, wear once, and trash mentality that we find in fast fashion. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think with consumers being more conscious, um, more conscious, they are uh, driving some of the change that we should be seeing coming in the opposite direction. We should be seeing top down um, better choices and better changes. Uh, instead, right. I think some consumers are driving that by choosing the companies and products that do fall in line like that. Like, like Rothy's has a recycling program, Puma and Adidas, they're using recyclable product now. Um, even some Under Armour clothing, it, it has a little tag on it that says what it was made out of. So I think that people are being more conscious consumers, uh, 
And I also think that there has been an uptick in certain things like the free cycle sites um, by nothing. It's mm-hmm. a place where you can ask for something that you're looking for or give something away that you no longer need. And with children, they grow out of things so quickly. And, you know, a pair of cleats that fit them this year may not fit them next year. And right. it's a great way to get a, sort of a, a hand me down upcycling in our local communities. Uh, and then, you know, kind of nationwide, there are companies like Rent the Runway that you can rent a single use dress and return it. So you know, you're not having to have that waste. Um, right. High end thrift stores. Uh, thrift stores are not uh, thought of how they used to be. Now it's a place where we actually shop and uh, it doesn't have the stigma, I think, as maybe it once had. So I think that our, our, uh, our deals are changing about it. I think our consciousness is changing and I think we're being more educated consumers. I, and I love that you talked about thrift stores because, you know, that's one of the things that, like you said, the, the, the stigma that used to be attached to that is so much, it, it's, it's fading away, I think. And especially with some of the, the online options as well of reusing clothes and the, Buying and reusing, that's one of the things that's 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 great too as an option. And yeah, and it's, my little, and it's this is my little thrift store ring. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> really. It's you know, this I got this from Buy Nothing. It was a hand me down from a friend. Um, right, and right. it's a it's a great it's an expensive label. And so and our kids are um, you know, our kids want to help. Um, they look at this as helping the environment, they look at this as helping others when we can say, you know what? This may not fit us anymore, but it's still perfectly usable and it's in great shape. Mm-hmm. Do you think somebody else could would want to use this? Do you think someone else could find value with this? And, and absolutely, yes. Um, kids are tuned to that. And also, you talked about the fact that it's 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 a change of mindset um, with people, and people are really now starting to get it more. And I I would even say that when I found out about a lot of things with fast fashion, I shared it with others. And I shared the particular companies that were, you know, doing certain things. And, you know, I didn't feel comfortable buying from, from that anymore. And then, you know, I, I get comments from my friends saying, oh, you made me feel like I, I really want to buy from this, but I, I can't seem to make myself buy from, from these stores anymore because I know some of the human rights things that go on along with it. And also just the, the fast fashion and how you're promoting it as well. So it is a mindset. And so you're being a change agent too. too. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I I would like to think so. (laughs) So I also want to say that there are schools that are looking to incorporate waste management reduction as well into their yearly planning. What would you, what would be your advice for them um, as far as doing that? Yeah, I, I would this is one of the, the the hills that I'll die on. I truly believe that we have such an opportunity in our school systems for sustainability champions. Um, there are a lot of different um, avenues in schools that have waste, whether it's in your cafeteria or um, your lost and found, like the textiling or clean out times. Um, the end of the school year, there's so many extra supplies that that two months later in the calendar year are being asked for again. And so I think that it could start with, uh, you know, if we're talking top down, I think that in tandem, there's, there could be a sustainability policy of your school that says we're going to use recyclable products. We will choose uh, climate resilient building practices. Um, we will use re- refillable water bottles um, and, you know, water refill stations to impact our single use plastics. Additionally, I think you can look at the calendar and say, okay, what are times of the year that we may have excess that we need to deal with? For sure, it's end of year clean out. Can we create a process where perfectly good binders and paper and pencils and things can come to a sort of storeroom that a month and a half later, when teachers and educators come back into school, they can get kind of go shopping and fill up their needs with some of the extras that have been left behind from the prior year. Uh, 
there could be things like, you know, a share fair or a wish board of like particular, like a uh, classroom furniture that they may be looking for doing audits. You could do a cafeteria audit. You could get the children involved in that from the environmental and, and green community, a uh, green team things. There are always teachers who are looking at doing the gardens and maybe we can get some of them involved with, um, doing a waste audit and collection, um, doing contests. Like we talked about the textile contest as a fundraiser. I think those are really great and not just talking about the what, but the why behind it. So right. what was the impact? Why are we even doing this? Why does it matter? Um, kids are much and humans in general, um, need to understand the why we can take action a whole lot better when we know the why and it becomes more meaningful. So I think taking a look at the calendar and looking at your, um, your resources and start small, pick one thing. Maybe it's textile bins, maybe it's, um, you know, recycling in your cafeteria. And then, uh, the buy-in will come naturally. I would say, <laughs> would you say that we piloted in, um, we piloted the bins in one of our schools. We, of course, there were some nerves. What if there's excess dumping? You know, what if, uh, if they get too full? What if, you know, it doesn't work, whatever. Um, all those were, they ended up being moot points. It wasn't an issue. Um, and as we had success there, we were able to share it with our other schools and say, hey, look, here's the success that we've had at the high school. Uh, this is what it's raised in rebate funds. And this is how we've helped educate our children. And seeing the success really makes uh, people a whole lot more eager to jump on board and knowing that they're not the first ones. Um, but having a really strong pilot championship program um, or champion program to kick off a program is really helpful too, um, helping it run smoothly. And I just wanted to go back because you talked about um, just collecting the things at the end of the year and kind of making it a sword storage space is it now you can correct me if i'm wrong is is this something that happens every year that that at the end of the year that they dump everything or put it into the trash is that so in in, in general uh there's what's called locker clean out there are bins trash bins throughout the hallways the kids just pull their things out and toss them in. And what we did in one of our, um, in our middle school this year is we had sort stations. We had some of our parent volunteers come in to help with it, where binders would go into this bin. Uh, what do you call the three ring binders or single uh, binders, or excuse me, um, paper, like the, the notepads, those would go into this bin. Um, and there are some organizations that can take those. There are some that, uh, you know, we may keep to have in, before school, after school programs. And then there may be, uh, you know, when we talk about children in need, our back to school collection, uh, like the, the package that we need to bring into the school can cost upwards of $60. And that's pretty pricey for some basics that may have a lot of extras lying around in the prior school year. And the thing that we know about teachers is that teachers will reach into their pocketbooks or their mm -hmm. their pockets and go ahead and buy some of those supplies. So that would be yeah. very helpful to just have them on hand. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're working on that piece. <laughs> it's creating a system that could be repeatable, ultimately, that it, repeatable and shareable to other organizations. And um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. People have been doing this long before us. It's just great to get together and share those great ideas. So my last question to you before we ask Haley to jump in here and give some of his comments, um, how can individuals and the community at large uh, change their waste disposal habits? And and while we're talking about that, what's the real takeaway of the importance of the behavioral change? So I think, like we talked about, it comes down to, to marketing and um, in publicity. People need to know what can be textile recycled and where it needs to go. So there's kind of the logistical piece. Um, inside my, uh, where my washer and dryer are, I have two bags hooked on the wall. One is for, you know, clothing that needs to be given away inside our neighborhood. And one is for clothing and textiles that need to go to the bin. And the, just when that bag gets full, I drop it, put it in the car and drop it by the textile bin. 
Um, so it's kind of creating a process and a habit uh, that leans into that behavioral change. And then once you start having that behavioral mind shift, it's kind of like wearing a, a seatbelt. If you get into the car now and you don't have your seatbelt on, you feel like something's wrong. You feel a little naked. Right. Like, like I'm not, I'm not ready to drive yet. Um, same thing can happen with, um, you know, I, we do composting up in the cafeteria now. And it, it, when kids accidentally throw something in the wrong bin, they're like, Oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. They, they're conscious of their, their action and, um, and focused on doing the right thing and why for the climate. Right. You've opened up that door and now they can't close it. They you can't unsee it, right? It <laughs> yeah. Okay. Haley, can you jump in if you if you have any comments? Oh, I just can't help myself. I always got comments. <laughs> um the, let's see. Um what I mean, one of the interesting things I think you're doing is really changing people's perspectives about the value of garbage. Um, and you're taking things that have been a cost center for these schools and changing it into a revenue generator. Uh, is that, I mean, is that an accurate assessment of kind of what's going on? I think that's definitely accurate and a real big bonus um, to the whole program. Uh, we want we want to do things because they're the right things to do. Uh Sometimes things like laws and financial um, encouragement help. Great. And um, you, you talked a lot about, um, you know, the need for effective communications and public relations to get, you know, sort of the, the grassroots to meet the top down somewhere in the middle. And it, it all sort of uh, congeals into a longer longer term solution, a sustainable solution. I'm just wondering, are there specific messages that you've seen that have been particularly valuable and persuasive in this in this area? I think utilizing the um, the news outlets that are most watched or or um, valued in each community. So some of it is is really going to be community specific. We have a really active. Um, local Facebook pages um, for parents and caregivers and for our general community. You can put something on there and it's going to have some reach. Our Bedford Citizen newspaper, we get a daily email of the, the new newspaper articles and it comes at a, the right time at night or in the morning and it gets a lot of traction. So really identifying how um, how best to get your message out and which uh, outlets to use, I think is really important. Um, but it definitely helps by creating a spider web of champions, um, people who can talk openly to these concepts and why and, and kind of get that energy going about it and just sharing. Um, so much of this work is sharing what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, uh, and people enjoy hearing that stuff and, um, and want to do better. They really do. They just don't always know how. Yeah. One of the things we see with our school program is that, you know, I could talk to someone who's running a school all day um, and they won't hear me, but if the principal from the school down the road talks to them and says, Hey, this is the experience we've had. It just goes all that much further. So um, that it's a very interesting point. I think you brought up there. Um, okay, a couple more here for you, if you got a minute. Um, the first um, is, what do you have planned uh, in the coming years? As we're looking, you know, five, ten, fifteen years down the road, what are some of the innovations that you're hoping you'll see and and to enact? We have a we have a pretty good 15 year plan uh, going here in Bedford, and uh, one of the main things is having waste sorting happen in all four of the schools in our district in our cafeterias. So separating out the unused foods to a food share cart or refrigerator where uh, kids who don't want something on their tray can drop it, kids who want something more can can eat it, and there's no stigma about it. It's a free 
free open program. Uh, then you're dumping out your liquids so we're not incinerating liquids. And then you're going to trash, composting the food, and uh, then using reusable trays. So that process is something that's on our radar screen to implement um, district-wide in the next year and a half to two years. Additionally, getting our wow. greenhouses and gardens up and running at some of our mm -hmm. schools is an additional way to say, okay, look, when you're composting that food in the cafeteria, this breaks down and goes back into the ground and creates this bag of compost that we can then grow additional food with. And uh, we do have garden clubs starting and some farm to table uh, programs starting in our schools. Um, solar, we're looking at solar as we get new roofs on our on our school buildings and solar canopies. So solar uh, wind, uh, solar and, and wind energy generation and teaching the kids about that um, is going to be really key. And uh, decarbonizing our buildings, so moving off fossil fuels with our large scale mm -hmm. hot water heater and boiler purchases moving forward. Kind of in a nutshell, what we're looking at, and hopefully a microgrid. Oh, <laughs> not not ambitious at all. Yeah, it's a fifteen year plan. I'm just wondering, Aaron, how much of this is going to require more manpower? Is that going? Are you going to have to? you know, increase your budget as far as staff and personnel because of this? Yeah, I actually had just made a uh, pitch to the superintendent and leadership team at our schools of what it would take to roll out the cafeteria program in the next uh, three schools. And there's some really creative ways that we can do some of these plans, um, you know, over this 15 year stretch of grants. There's a lot of grants coming out uh, that can help us cover some of those capital costs and, and staffing costs. There's some great relationships we're forming with our Council on Aging for senior citizen uh, work programs and some of our differently able students and young adults um, through our special ed program to have career readiness internships to be some of those monitors in our cafeterias to help guide students through that process or be dishwashers in our cafeteria. So um, yes, staffing is definitely going to be necessary, but then, you know, there's the offsets because what, instead of spending a hundred percent of our dollars on trash hauling, if we can divert, we've diverted about 82% of that. So now we're only spending 18% on trash. So there's a, change there you know there's there's some dollars that we can capture there and things like the rebate program from textiles helps give us funds to create more programs so yeah but it is always it's it does come down to not only what's right but how do we do it financially right and monica that really kind of got to my last question um and you know i'm just wondering where if it sounds like people come along uh, pretty quickly. Like if they don't understand it, once they see it and how it works, uh, they jump on board pretty quickly. Um, but there has to be some pushback and resistance, I assume, that the cost uh, and resources is one area. I'm just wondering if you're seeing other areas of pushback and resistance um, that are persistent or, um, you know, are people pretty quick to jump on board once they see how, how it all works? Yeah, so I think that in general, I'd like to um, I'd like to quantify that and say we are. In my experience, I like to be a yes. I really like that idea. Let's figure out how to make it happen, as opposed to a no. I don't know if we can do that. It it may be too challenging. Um, so I like to be able to say, okay, how can we make this? happen. Uh, there are some logistical things. We're short staffed in our cafeterias. That's not uncommon across the country right now and probably across the world. Uh, so with being short staffed, we don't have the people to run the dishwashing machine to wash the trays. So we've reverted to a disposable tray. Now, if we're using styrofoam versus compostable, unfortunately, the single use plastics, which are trash, are uh, cheaper. And so there is a cost to having a better disposable tray. Uh, it can be offset in certain areas, but when we talk about staffing and, and higher costs for a reusable product, there needs to be, that's where the policy comes in. If we say, 
this is this is what we want to do. We are going to try and minimize it to the lowest financial impact, but we are willing to put the finances to this goal because we believe it's the right thing to do. And um, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, yes, there is a financial component. It is tricky. Uh, there is pushback. Certain things like uh, solar panel canopy in a beautifully wooded area may get some pushback from environmentalists that it is not aesthetically pleasing, um, even though it is helping the environment. So you got to find these happy mediums. Well, if there's not any more questions, I did want to have, I did have one question for you. Um, are, are your schools going toward the 2030 and the 2050 goals? Is that, is yes. that the? Yes. Okay. So they're fully on board with the, the SDG uh, goals. Yes. Yes, we are. Um, it is really important to us as a community. We have that overarching goal. Uh, we do have it for our schools as well. And um, now it's creating the the staffing. Uh, I Like I said, I think that, it, uh, that we could have a sustainability coordinator or champion for our schools as well as for our town. You're seeing a lot of sustainability coordinators for towns. Um, I think there is just as much to be done in our schools that can fill a more than part-time to full-time role. So I would, in a perfect world, love to see that rolled out. And uh, are you on track for, for either of the goals? You know, that that's a data question and we don't have, uh, we haven't had a recent data poll. Um, yes, our, biz, our our buildings, yes, our decarbonization is really, a, a few of our buildings are already uh, decarbonized and uh, lights have all been changed out to energy efficient ones. Uh, so we do have, our school buildings for sure are on track for, for those goals. Some of the practices inside of them, we need to work on a little bit, but we'll get there. Well, it's a little things. <laughs> it all adds up, right? Well, things count, yeah, right? They do. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you for coming on Sustainable Solutions with Planet Aid. Uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. And we hope that uh, you have been inspired to our, our listeners and our watchers uh, by the ideas that we've explained today and explored. And we encourage you to search for your sustainable solutions that you can pursue so you can be a good steward in your neck of the woods and beyond. Kelly. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I really come out of this podcast very encouraged. Um, you know, I think sometimes the problems we talk about and the solutions uh, can be a little discouraging, but to see schools doing this and to see the kids being brought along um, who, you know, they'll be running things in 20 years. Um, so to plant those seeds now is just so encouraging, I think. So I really appreciate that uh, aspect of it. Um, so thank you, Monica. A few reminders for our listeners on the way out. If you want to stay connected with us and stay informed about the latest sustainable solutions, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And please share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. Together, we can make a difference. Remember, these changes start with awareness and action. So let's keep the conversation going. Feel free to reach out to us on social media, through our website. Share your thoughts, ideas, and stories with us. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, remember, it's a big world out there, but every small change counts. Together, we can build a better, more sustainable future. Thanks so much.